All right, very good morning to you and welcome to the second half of 2021. Can't believe it's flown by this quickly. Uh, but as usual, then we'll have a bit of a, a quick review of how the first six months have gone. And despite a lot of the tension more recently about this idea of um, what more sticky inflation could mean, the Delta variant and the new spread that we're seeing that could jeopardize the global economic recovery, the S&P 500 has actually put in its second best start of the year since 1998. Uh, and a few other stats, the gauge now has notched its longest streak of quarterly gains since 2017, having rallied already some 14% this year. So as you can see here, now off to a really strong start. Um, and looking at one of the other things here is the overall year-to-date performance uh, of some of the individual sectors that we've seen and looking at individual companies. And you can see despite... A bit of an idea of earlier in the year, a rotation out of some of these growth, big mega cap tech names and into um, other value areas. In fact, yes, everything has gone up, but growth, the show's not over just yet. Um, so even though they're talking about rate rises, again, don't forget they're talking about another two years out on the time horizon. And so the likes of Google, you know, I just said the S&P was up on the year, 14%. Google's up. 40% on the, the year to date. Microsoft up 21. Uh, Facebook is, is tracking up about 27%. You know, so some really sharp gains. But the fact that the rates market is anticipating to increase over time, one yields are moving higher. You know, a lot of those banks have also seen some really sharp moves. Wells Fargo up around 50%. Um, Bank of America up around 36%. Um, and in the capital market space, some of those big banks as well, GS up 43%, MS up 34%. So all in all, the gravy train continues for the time being. Um, and yeah, and, and, and looking at the, the performance from what we had um, yesterday, uh, there's a couple of individual sweet spots talking of Wednesday session. You can see here Walmart uh, just glowing green. They, they finished the day up about 2.7%. Uh, that came after they reported they would start selling prescription only insulin analog and there's some other hotspots ge they got added to goldman's uh, top idea on their stock pick list and they were up about three uh, percent boeing as well which is a, a fairly sizable firm will also saw some pretty decent gains yesterday after a german defense ministry announced a, a military um, or a maritime control aircraft order and that came after United Airlines unveiled its largest ever order for new planes as well from the firm. So a couple of things there just helping as well, um, because if you actually look at where we closed yesterday, you know, we're still right up there. The S&P 500, of course, has traded at record all time highs again, um, as far as the overnight session is concerned. And I was talking to this or well, about this move yesterday to a couple of the traders and we were looking at that that kind of trend channel that we were observing in yesterday's briefing and the fact that that was that horizontal key line, the daily pivot yesterday. And for me, that breakdown was purely technical and we were talking about it when we were down and around the S1 as you know, this, this is often the mechanics of how markets work. It doesn't always need to be a news catalyst for sure. And a technical breach of levels can add then to whether you're trading the, the kind of breakout or momentum strategy. And then fundamentally, though, very unlikely, we were saying at the time that that move would be sustained, given the fact that there isn't any real new fundamental rationale to keep price suppressed, to keep moving lower. And when we're trading up at all time high levels, it's not uncommon to see a little bit of profit taking as well. So with the technical trigger for the downside, I think a lot of people just use that as an opportunity to re-enter short term to push us back up to all time highs again, of which... Obviously, we busted through in late in the Wall Street close, and then that's acted now as a bit of a platform for price to continue to push on up during the APAC session. And so for now, just keeping an eye on these prices uh, at these most elevated levels once again. A couple of bigger things as well coming out. We'll look at the calendar uh, for the day ahead in a moment, but of course, non-farm payrolls as well looming on Friday. Um, in the FX market, while I'm on the, um, when I'm on the charts, in terms of the six-month performance for the beginning of this year, the dollar um, has been 
um, seeing a really good performance of late within that period. And in fact, the dollar had its best month in June since March of 2020. Uh, and you remember March 2020, after some initial volatility, that was when the dollar really rallied on the back of the notion of it being the global reserve currency when we went through the worst part of the equity sell-off when we had the onset of the global pandemic. So that was the last time when the dollar put in a type of performance that it's seen since June. And just having a look at the euro dollar currency pair here on a daily chart, you can really see how the narrative has changed. And you'll remember this here is June 16th was the initiation of this first candlestick here. And you guys remember what that was, of course. That was the hawkish FOMC two dot indication for 2023 rate rise and the idea, the admission that they see inflation a little larger and hanging around a little longer than previously anticipated in their projections. And as such, that's really been the major trigger point over the last couple of weeks. Um, in, a, in a few different asset classes. And for sure, euro dollar, you can see here, this is quite a key moment today about where we close. You can see we've bounced on three occasions from this level in the euro. Uh, but we are getting a bit of a divergence, of course, in the fundamental dynamics here between the ever more increasingly sounding hawkish Fed against, at the moment, a much more passive, more dovish sounding um, ECB because they're just not making the same kind of hawkish noises to any degree of what the Fed are. And that's because obviously the Eurozone a lot more fractured in terms of the general national economic performances of the different nations and also it is dealing at this present point in time with the latest outbreak and the uptick in the Delta variant as well, which is seen as a considerable risk. And that's likely to keep the, the ECB's hands steady for a, the foreseeable future. Whereas in the US, of course, we, we're talking every day about, you know, when are we going to start talking about tapering? When are we going to start you know, hinting towards more rate rises and so on? So here, technically, I think it looks interesting for the euro because if we continue this type of um, situation at the moment, fundamentally, it's in play. Um, that divergence, which plays favorable for further downside, technically now is where it's at, and technically it does look vulnerable. And any further movement lower, the 118, kind of 11, 18 handle would be the next obvious target. And we're looking about 50 pips lower from where we're trading at the moment, of course. Um, similarly, then, the, the pound is doing the same kind of thing. Uh, there's been the eventual grace period extensions on some of the Brexit protocol around Northern Ireland and trade. But you remember what we were saying a few weeks ago, that was never going to go any other way, in our opinion. So I don't think it's really that that important, to be quite honest. But looking at the daily on the pound here, um, at the moment, it really is that, again, the, um, the, the fact that the dollar is putting in the performance at the moment, and that's weighing on these counterparty currencies. And so here, 138 handle um, has been a key milestone of support going back to late April and also uh, back when the dollar was appreciating. This was here, this was the base, this red candle of the hawkish bullard comment initiated by here, this candle. So this move from 141 to 138 was on the back of the hawkish Fed week and the Fed and the bullard comments. And we're right back at that area at the moment. So when you're looking at the euro as well, at least this potential for that momentum. You know, if cable starts to also see a bit of head of steam on the breakthrough 38, then all the more conviction you might have to hold then for that euro move down uh, to those lower bound levels we just looked at. So some key levels there in the FX markets to have a, have a look at. And so eyes will be on a dollar. And obviously, if it doesn't happen today, tomorrow is going to be a really key one. These are key technical levels that we're sitting at at the minute on a higher time frame. And so if the payroll number comes out tomorrow and it's a strong one, so we start talking about a million plus type job figure uh, and robustness within the actual overall report, well then could that fuel further belief of the more hawkish rhetoric and then therefore appreciation further of the US dollar. And with these, those pairs sitting at fairly technically support vulnerable levels, that could be a nice trigger for, for continuation of those short positions. Otherwise, elsewhere, um, gold, you know, we looked at this yesterday and there was a really key area we've been looking at this week. And again, same top level macro narrative. It's all about the Fed and the US and the hawkish rhetoric. So here you can see gold the same. Gold's just been a really nice um, 
kind of tracker of the inverse relationship with the currency, the dollar at the moment. And so um, as the dollar is appreciated, just like those major pairs, gold's come under considerable pressure since that FMC meeting on the 16th of June. And earlier this week, so this is going back uh, two days ago on Tuesday, we traded through and we did yesterday trade through that key area that I've been keeping an eye on around the 62 mark in gold futures, but we closed at that level. So we haven't closed below it. And so now technically, I think that's just given a bit of light relief here for the yellow metal. We've just traded back up um, a little bit on the upside this morning. And we're currently up six bucks trading at 77, having got down from as low as around 50 um, in the last two sessions. So I think technically this is looking a little bit more supportive now, having failed to breach that mark um, so far this, this week. But again, payrolls might well dictate that dollar movement and subsequently move then um, will be the next kind of catalyst for movement in in gold. All right, quick look at then um, a few different things. Obviously, a lot of people talking about OPEC at the moment. Um, a familiar dynamic is really opening up with the uh, alliance with Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, proposing boosts, which they've kind of done before. We've been here before. It's very familiar territory. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Arab allies favoring a more cautious approach. This is according to delegates in Bloomberg or who Bloomberg were talking to last night. Um, while the group is expected to return some barrels to the market in August, obviously nervousness is still present on the back of the latest outbreak of the Delta variant, which is at the moment seeing an increasing global spread for the, for the time being. Um, the balance being there is our people, uh, our, our nations who are large energy consumers like the US, for example, um, have they been inoculated enough and is the economy reopening fast enough that would constitute then one way or the other to add some more supply or keep it as it is, is the, is the debate. Um, possible supply hikes are being discussed for August and September, according to Kazakhstan's energy minister. Uh, not that that person is particularly important, but obviously they are very closely aligned with Russia. And last time they were giving a bit of a pass to increase just fractionally by a few hundred thousand barrels per day. Collectively, Russia and Kazakhstan kind of go as a two. They're a pairing in that sense. So I put a little bit of weight in that, those comments. Um, as ever, the usual rules of engagement, I would say, with OPEC news, you're going to get um, further intensification of rumors and hearsay that might add to a little bit of the choppiness um, intraday for oil. And as ever, you're not going to have to wait for a formal decision. You're probably going to get more clarity as we go through the next 24 hours of what their end outcome decision will be. As far as oil is trading at the moment, it's just wait and see. Um, we're, we're pretty much in a range at the minute between really 72 and, and the higher 74 price point. Um, and so until we get more depth, more information on this, um, uh, I just think we're going to respect that range for the time being. Um, some other things, though, to be aware of. Um, well, this, this is oil over the first six months. I uh, just wanted to quickly flash this, given the fact that we talked about equities, we talked about the dollar. Uh, this is looking at WCI crude and Brent futures. And yeah, quite a, quite a phenomenal story, actually, over the last six months. If you take where we were and uh, going back to the base um, from October, November time to where we're trading at from the year to date, which was around, in, as far as WTI is concerned, sub 50. And we're up, obviously, up near 75 at the moment. So, yeah, really solid performance there that we've seen in WTI crude. Um, and in fact, in terms of the streak, it's the best half for WTI crew we've seen since 2009. And again, it's all really simplifying it. It's based on the reopening trade. Um, other, other thing to mention on oil was what I thought was quite interesting was this. Um, so in the US, over the last four weeks, total stockpiles, including the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the SPR, have fallen at a rate of 1.15 million barrels per day, marking the largest four-week decline on a rolling basis in the EIA's data going back to 1982. So again, just to make that clear, so stockpiling on a four-week basis in America is being drawn down at its fastest pace that we've had in a very, very long time, which again goes to, goes to show this overall tightening in the market on the back of the, the faster acceleration in the pickup in demand 
comparative to the fairly static situation on the supply side. And hence the reason the price is trading up at a multi-year high up at around the 75 region. But again, this is the balancing act between the decisions that that mainly dynamic between Saudi and Russia need to play. The Saudis generally more cautious. Let's keep it as it is. Whereas the Russians, for kind of similar reasons to this, are saying like, right, we should you know, demand is adequate. We should be we should be re relax relaxing the um, supply a little bit. And and why not? I think if I was in Ru in Russia's situation and I was at the negotiating table, I would know that I can manage my budget at a much more lower price. I know the Saudis can't because of their quest for general diversification in the period ahead. And so therefore, I would hold their feet to the fire. They will bulk and I'll get a few extra hundred thousand barrels over the line. I don't think necessarily from a trading point of view, that's going to move the price to a great deal because I think a lot of it is baked in in terms of the 500,000. If you don't get the 500,000, or anything short of that, well, I think we could we could definitely push up and start retesting, hitting highs again. Um, so if I was the Russians, I'd be doing exactly the same type of thing, causing a headache, rolling over meetings. The, the Saudis will roll over and, and they will concede and they will give you what you need, which is a few more hundred thousand barrels per day. And, and then you just keep the supply packed intact, but you've got away with a little bit more of a concession that you were in the day before. So that's kind of what I'm expecting on that regard. The other thing here is, is a, a word that gets mentioned is Iran. And this is another key component that's in focus with the determining the price of oil at the moment. Negotiation, negotiations over Iran's nuclear program are facing the prospect of renewed delays, is what we heard yesterday. And so the likelihood of a quick return of the nation's supplies are, are being kind of pared back. And remember, there's a lot of uh, debate about how, how quickly can Iran in actuality, given the, the distinct lack of investment that they've had, the infrastructure, it's not like they just turn a tap and the nation starts pumping out an extra couple of million. Uh, it's a lot more gradual than that. However, they do have quite a large strategic stockpile offshore, which they could start to bring back in, albeit I'd see OPEC having a big problem with that if they ever considered that being the case. Um, but again, just the, the, the connection here being that a breakdown in dialogue, meaning that the further away a deal is, well, then that just puts off any notion of Iran bringing more oil back to market anytime soon is the basic premise. Envoys negotiating over Iran's nuclear program will not con reconvene as planned in Vienna this week. And apparently the talk is that they aren't even sure when the seventh round of diplomacy will be scheduled, according to four people familiar with that discussion who chose not to be identified and, and were close to those talks. So it's off for the moment. Uh, timing is quite key, though. I would say that's not that surprising given timing of the OPEC meeting. I still think that it'll be interesting to monitor Iran through July before the inauguration of Rahisi, the new president-elect comes in in Iran, because I think tactically that does play true. I think it, if they are going to sign up back to this 2015 uh, nuclear accord with the US and Western powers, then it's better to do so between July and August before the inauguration to pass off any concessions to Rahini to... to um, maintain your political kind of capital as the new president-elect coming in. So it's something to watch going forward, but for now it's it's delayed. The other thing then is is China. Um, a quick mention overnight, you do have some Chinese data. Again, I do not think that this is a factor for the market open this morning, but to make you aware, the Keishin manufacturing PMI for June came in at 51.3. That was a touch softer than expected. And so as the headline suggests, then factory activity expanding at a slightly softer pace in June, the resurgence of COVID-19 cases in the export province of Guangdong, as well as supply chain woes, drove output growth to its lowest in 15 months, is what Reuters had reported overnight. More so, though, on the geopolitical side, um, you might have seen some of these shots from last night, quite remarkable scenes, actually, coming out of Beijing last night. Um, and this because... President Xi Jinping warned against foreign bullying and China uh, were marking their party centenary overnight. Xi pledged to build up China's military, committed to the reunification of Taiwan. It's a very contentious issue, of course, and said that social stability would be ensured in Hong Kong. Now, separate news that you've seen, but definitely related to this, is that the 
Um, US and Japan have been conducting war games and joint military exercises in the event of a conflict with China over Taiwan. Now, this stuff is definitely not a coincidence. Obviously, the, the Chinese party having this centenary event uh, is a big uh, kind of domestic deal. It's a chance for them to really you know, galvanize the public on their, the mission that China has and particularly on that one China policy of which they see the sovereignty of Taiwan. And so the US and Japan conducting war games at the time of which they're celebrating their centenary is all absolutely you know, calculated in terms of where, why they're doing this. You know, does this bring us any closer towards new levels of confrontation? No, this is just how politics is done, in my opinion, in that region. And so I wouldn't get too nervous about it. But just wanted to bring to people's attention who are not used to looking at this type of news flow that these things are not happening in isolation. They're all happening at this particular one point in time for the same reason, which is there's a lot of um, political capital on the line and there's an ongoing more top level discussion and friction at the minute between the US and China and all of this feeds into that kind of narrative. Okay, quick look at the, the day ahead. What have we got on the agenda? Um, it's this morning we have the final manufacturing uh, PMI data points, so not anticipating too much out of those, to be honest. The OPEC meeting, yeah, I'd, I'd be looking out for news and, and tweets and so forth as we go throughout the session. I definitely don't think you're going to have to need to wait till 3.30 and 5 for more definitive confirmation. That's rarely the case, but those are the timings if you need to be aware of them if you're trading the energy market. Otherwise, in the US session, you've got the initial jobless claims expected to fall back down to 390 from 411. And then you've got the ISM manufacturing PMI, which is expected to remain relatively unchanged from a headline perspective at 61. However, keep an eye as ever on that employment constituent. It was just hovering above expansionary territory of 50 last time out. And of course, people will be looking at that closely as a, as a kind of a, a contributing factor to give better insight as to how the labor report from the BLS might perform in NFP uh, tomorrow. As far as speakers, a um, couple actually to be aware of. So coming up shortly, um, ECB President Christine Lagarde speaking uh, at a hearing on monetary affairs, text to be released. So keep an eye out for that, 8 a.m. London time. And the Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey speaks at Mansion House with text to be released, and that'll be at nine o'clock this morning. So for any FX traders, Euro, Sterling, with these key levels um, looking, uh, as I said, fairly vulnerable at the moment amid just the ongoing dollar strength, I'd definitely be keeping an eye out for, for some of these comments, um, given that technical setup of those charts. Feds Bostic, who is a voter, speaking at seven, and then supply out of Spain and France uh, and the UK later on today. Um, but that is it. So going to let you guys go on with the day. Have a good one. Come on, Andy. It's only round two. Um, but yeah, a little glimmer of the old Andy Murray came out last night, which was great to see. So good job, Andy. And uh, yeah, have a good day, everyone.